Hello, good evening. This is Pastor Reed Ellis here at River of Life Worship Center. And I uh, just wanted to talk to you a little bit today about our video quality. Uh, about three weeks ago, we had uh, Windows 10 update and it did some things to our drivers and our capture device. And we are have still not been able to resolve that issue. And so you'll notice that the video quality is very jerky and um, kind of hard to watch. Be great to listen to as a podcast. As you get farther into the video and we get into the teaching uh, video from the Bible Project, that video quality is very good. And so that part would be great to watch because of the visual effects that are in it. And it's in about 30, 30 minutes, 28 to 30 minutes in is where that teaching video is and goes for seven, almost eight minutes. Um, again, I'm sorry for the quality of the video and uh, we're working to get this fixed and we hope to do so this week. We're continuing our series of messages. As we've started in the book of Genesis, we're working our way toward the book of Revelation. I might take a little bit longer when we get there just because of all the things that we're facing <laughs> here in our world today. We'll kind of see you when we get there. But today we're in 2 Timothy. The author of 2 Timothy was the same author as we've been going through all the Pauline epistles. The Apostle Paul has written approximately 65 to 68 AD, kind of depending on, remember, as we talked about in 1 Timothy, whether Paul was released from prison and had a second imprisonment or not, whether you follow that line of thinking or whether it was a single uh, imprisonment. The Reconstruction, if we look at 2 Timothy, as we look back at his life and try to figure out what path his life took, he didn't give us every detail of his life, but we saw some things in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy and some of the other books that he wrote that he went to cities that he didn't mention in the book of Acts at all up until the time he went and was in prison the first time. And this is why we're very suspicious that the Apostle Paul uh, spent time outside of prison after the first imprisonment and went and visited these churches and these things happened and then he was re-imprisoned for the final time. And he was either martyred at that, after that second one or he was released and went into Spain. We do not know. Okay. It's also possible that he went into Spain right after his first imprisonment because we know that the, that was the desire of his heart to do so. Um, we know then afterward, he, after, if he was able to get out of prison after this first one, he probably went back to Ephesus. We see him talk about that in 1 Timothy 1. There he leaves Timothy behind. At some point he went to Troas, <clears throat> where he visited Carpus. That's not mentioned in Acts at all. There he left some books and parchments and a cloak, his heavy cloak he left there. Um, 2 Timothy 4.13 mentions this briefly. He traveled to Miletum where Trophimus was left sick, because he left Trophimus before, but he wasn't sick. He traveled um, then to Miletum, and he leaves him sick, to Crete, where T uh, Titus was a pastor. Titus 1.5 talks about this. And then he went on to Corinth, 2 Timothy 4.20. Then he journeyed to Nicopolis in Macedonia, Titus 3.12. And this is where we get all these little mentions of things. And as we're reading through, we could just skip over them and miss these details we weren't paying attention. Now, someplace along the route, two significant events took place. Paul wrote the epistles to Timothy and to Titus. And second, Paul returned to Rome where we believe he was imprisoned a second time and the final time. It should be mentioned that several of the early church fathers, in their writings, this is what they say of Paul that Paul carried the gospel to Spain. When and where, like I said, we're not sure. We know he really wanted to do that. Um, if Paul was able to carry out that mission, he must have visited Spain right after he was released from his first imprisonment, unless we think that he wasn't martyred. But also the early church fathers talk about him being martyred. So these are things... We don't, we don't know, okay? We're just guessing. Um, we just take from these things. The time necessary for the events mentioned above to happen 
and the closing year would have happened during the closing years of Nero's reign. And any of you that have studied here, uh, history know that Nero was not a nice guy. He killed a lot of people. As a matter of fact, he burned down the city of Rome. You know, we're pretty sure that it was his fault that that happened, although he blamed it on the Christians, and there was a terrible persecution that came because of that. So the second Timothy is written to Timothy, his dearly beloved son. He keeps referring to Timothy this way. The purpose, Paul's in prison in Rome when he wrote Second Timothy, we're sure of that. He'd already appeared for his preliminary hearing before the Supreme Court of Rome, which was before Caesar. Caesar was the emperor, but he was also the head of the judiciary. He was a Supreme Court justice, period. There were no other Supreme Court justices. He had appeared before Nero, and during his trial, no man stood with him. He refers to this, that he went in alone. No one was there. He had to face the charges by himself. 2 Timothy 4, 16 to 17, he mentions this. He talks about that some were forsaking the faith. So there was a lot of persecution during Nero's time, and they abandoned their beliefs in Jesus. There were others also, also that followed Paul to Rome to oppose him. Just as Paul had done that to people, others did it to him. Okay? He was about to be sentenced to death, and it seems that Paul knows this. He knows that his days are numbered. And he mentions in 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 through 8, he kind of hints at this, that this is the end of the road for him that he was never going to be able to write another letter to Timothy. This was it. Uh, this was going to be his last will and testament, per se. The last words he had ever penned. And several things were heavy upon his heart. And this is, comes about why he wrote it. Paul's heart ached for Timothy's companionship. Timothy had been a great friend to him. And any of you that have had a great friend in life and then you move apart from each other, know what that feels like. Oh, I wish I could sit and talk with them. I had a phone call on uh, Saturday evening, or Friday evening, I should say. Uh, a person that came and taught at the public school in, Tim, uh, in Tinian when we were there, uh, Lutheran, um, weren't really sure about his faith. You know, we witnessed to him. Uh, he was very lonely, he was single, he was there alone, and so he would come over and spend time at the school with us as our, we were starting that school out, and we would visit, and we would go out and eat breakfast together sometimes, and look out at the beach and talk about life. Yeah, out of the blue calls me Friday night. He's moved back to Florida, he's lived all over the world teaching in different situations. He just wanted somebody to talk to. And he knew that Joanne and I had sat and visited with him about spiritual things and everything that's going on in the world, he wanted to talk to me about those things and kind of see what I thought. <laughs> this is what Paul is feeling toward Timothy. I just want somebody, and people had abandoned him in Rome. They were scared to be around Paul. They thought they'd get arrested too. So they abandoned him. So he's all alone, and he's longing for somebody to talk to. And you hear that in Paul's voice as he writes this letter. And he calls him, my dear son. Paul wished, secondly, to share some final matters with his son and successor about things that he saw that were happening in the Roman Empire, and he saw things coming that he was scared about. And he wanted to warn Timothy about these things to make sure Timothy recognized the time and the season that they were living. Thirdly, Paul wanted his son Timothy to equip himself as well as possible for his great call. He knew Timothy had a call on his life, and he wanted to reaffirm him that he wouldn't abandon that call like some in Rome had abandoned their call from Christ. He wanted Timothy to fulfill the work that God had created before time for Timothy to do. That good thing which was committed to thee, he says, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwells in you. Fourthly, Paul felt the need to fortify the courage of his son Timothy. Timothy was trustworthy, 
But sometimes Timothy would get scared, just like as we all did, and he wanted to encourage him. Not only with courage, but physical strength, because Timothy also had some physical ailments that he talks about. He had stomach issues. He needed to take care of himself physically and spiritually in order to more adequately minister the gospel. You can't minister when you're sick. It's very hard to minister to others when you are sick yourself. And he encouraged him to be strong. Paul wanted to prepare his son for the perilous days that were coming. He felt the last days were upon them, kind of like we do today. So let's take a look at some select texts from 2 Timothy. And uh, I'll just hint right now, I selected them all. Timothy is so short, I said, you know what, I can read the whole book to you, and you really get the heart of Timothy. Here we go. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Now Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Interesting how he says that, isn't it? To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So we see this relationship with God the Father and his son Jesus Christ, very important. I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember in you in my prayers. A reminder to us, we need to pray one for another, do we not? Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Now I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois, there's that mention, and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now that that same faith lives in you also. How many of you know that your parents' faith is good, but you need to have your own faith? And Emma, I'm so glad you're coming to release time, and I, youth, because you're not worrying about whether your parents' faith is, that's good, but Emma, you need your own faith, don't you? And you're at that age to really confirm that in your heart. I'm so glad that you're doing that, that you are walking along with God, and you took that step of baptism a few weeks ago. Yeah, those are all important steps of us as we walk with God. Verse 6, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying of hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love, and of self-discipline. Interesting that those are the three that he mentions there for the time and the season. I think those three are the ones that the church needs today and the time and the season that we're living as well, do we not? We need power. Yes, we need to minister in love, and there's a lot of hate going around. To counteract that hate, we need to love with the love of Christ and to live lives of self-discipline which Paul in that other verse said, it binds all the fruit of the Spirit together in love. So do not be ashamed to testify by our Lord or ashamed of me as his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Mm. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. This is why I'm suffering as I am, yet I'm not ashamed. Because I know who I'm, whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. Great portion of Scripture, hopefully one that you have memorized. What I, you heard from me, keep us the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard this good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. And here we have the mention of the third person of the Trinity. You know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. Now may the Lord show mercy to the household of Onesiphorus. Sorry about that. Because he often refreshed me 
and was not ashamed of my chains. Now, on the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. So there are still some that are being faithful. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. You know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. Just think. Some of you have searched for people today, maybe old acquaintances, and you found them through Facebook or some other way. Just think back then. You come into a city like Rome, two to 300,000 people, and you know Paul, has said, he's written in his letter that that's where he's at. How do you find him? How persistent would you have to be to find somebody? So Charlene drives up to Minneapolis, St. Paul area, and she's up there in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and John's looking for her. Can you imagine that? <laughs> but you were able to find her with the aid of technology. But can you imagine trying to do that without? How persistent would you have to be looking for someone to find them in a city of 300,000 people? Wow. That guy was persistent because he did find Paul. He found him. 2 Timothy 1, or 2. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. So we need to be creating disciples, passing that information on to them, teaching them so that they can teach their children and their children for generations to come. Endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs. He wants to please a commanding officer. Similarly, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not receive the victor's crown unless he competes according to the rules. The hardworking farmer should be the first to share uh, to receive a share of the crops. So he uses these three illustrations to show about how we need to be very mindful of our commitment to our heavenly kingdom. Yes, we live on earth, but our focus needs to be on that kingdom and our service to that kingdom above all. Reflect on what I'm saying, for the Lord will give you insight into all of this. Now remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel for which I'm suffering, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But God's word is not chained. A reminder that even though men bind us, what can man do to us ultimately? Therefore I endure everything for the sake of the elect, so that they too may obtain the salvation that is Christ Jesus with eternal glory. So here's a trustworthy saying. If we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we disown him, he will also disown us. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. That's his saying. Interesting saying. Keep reminding them of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value. It only ruins those who listen. So those of you who want to get in debates with people on social media about how to prove that they're, you're right and they're wrong, what's Paul say? doesn't work. A person persuaded against his will is of the same opinion still. Yeah. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed, and who correctly handles the word of truth, the scriptures. Avoid godless chatter, because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. And I'll share a story with you next week, just a crazy story that came out in the Huffington Post. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Well, that's a good image, isn't it? <laughs> Among them are Hymenius and Philetus, who have wandered away from the truth. They say that the resurrection has already taken place, and they destroy the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm. 
It's sealed with this inscription, quote, The Lord knows those who are His, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness, end quote. Now, in a large house, there are many articles, not only of gold and silver, but also wood and clay. Some are for noble purposes, and some for ignoble, common. If a man cleanses himself from the latter, he will be an instrument for noble purposes, made holy, useful to the master, prepared to do any good work. But then he talks about the ignoble part. Flee the evil desires of youth. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. That's how you become noble for God's purposes. Don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments. Hmm. Because you know they produce quarrels. It's all what Facebook and all of that's about, isn't it? And the Lord's servants must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him must, be great, uh, must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who's taken them captive to do his will. Chapter 3. But mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Wow, was that a mouthful. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. What's Paul's advice? Have nothing to do with people like that. Why? Because they will influence you more than you influence them. We're in apple season. And I pick some boxes of apples, and well, I have to go and check them every few days because if one one apple in that box goes starts going bad, it's the weirdest thing. It just spreads to all the apples around it. Have you noticed that? And it's rapid. It can ruin a whole box of apples in no time. But if I take that one out, it's fine. Paul's telling us the same thing. If there's a rotten apple amongst you, don't have anything to do with them. They'll spoil you, too. They're the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sin and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never acknowledging the truth. Just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, also these men opposed the truth. Men of depraved minds, who as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. But they will not get very far, because as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, and endurance. My persecutions, sufferings, what kind of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra. The persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from them all. In fact, anyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Oh, you Christians don't want to hear that, do you? But it's true. While evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you... Continue in what you have learned, have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now all Scripture is God-breathed, 
and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Chapter 4. Now in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge, Timothy. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. We're kind of in that age now. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what all oh, their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their, a uh, their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. But you, keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry, for I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time has come for my departure. This is where he's hinting. He thinks the end is very near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there's in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Why did he want that coat? Winter was coming. We're pretty sure about the time of the year that he wrote this, that he, in that prison he was going to need that outer coat. Okay. Alexander the metal worker did me a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. And my first defense, no one came to my support. Everyone deserted me. Again, they were scared. They'd get arrested. May it not be held against them. He forgave them for abandoning him. But the Lord, he stood at my side. He gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and he will bring me safely where? To his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So greet Priscilla and Aquila, the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter, because I need that coat. Ebulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers. The Lord be with you in spirit. Grace be with you, Timothy. Powerful book. A lot of good stuff in there, isn't there? Let's watch our teaching video from the Bible Project. It's uh, copyright protected November 26 of 2016 at thebibleproject.com. Let's watch it together. Paul's second letter to Timothy. This is Paul's final and most personal letter. He wrote it from yet another time in prison, and it's addressed to Paul's dear co-worker and protege, the young Timothy. Now, we don't know how much time exactly has passed since he wrote 1 Timothy, but we can see that Paul's situation has changed, and for the worse. He's imprisoned in Rome, which could refer to his time under house arrest that was mentioned in Acts chapter 28, or it could be that he was released from that imprisonment, had another long season of ministry, and then was arrested again in Troas. Either way, Paul says he's in the middle of his court trial now, and it is not going well. He's pretty sure he's not going to survive this one. And so out of this very dark situation, Paul appeals to Timothy, who it seems is still on assignment in Ephesus. He asked Timothy to come be with him in prison so Paul can pass on to him the church planting mission he started. 
The letter's design is pretty simple. There are two large sections where Paul challenges Timothy. First, to accept his calling as a leader, and then, before he comes to Paul, to deal with the corrupt teachers that are still causing problems in Ephesus. After this, Paul concludes the letter. So Paul begins by thanking God for Timothy and his family, specifically for his grandmother Lois and his mother Eunice. They immersed the young Timothy in the story of the Old Testament scriptures. They instilled in him a deep faith in the Messiah Jesus. And so because of that firm faith, Paul offers his first challenge to Timothy. He calls him to reject any temptation to be ashamed of the good news about Jesus or of Paul who's suffering in prison for announcing that good news. Now, the reason Paul needs to emphasize this is the negative stigma that he gained by his frequent times in prison. It made many of Paul's co-workers, in fact, doubt his calling as an apostle. He mentions two guys, Fugelis and Hermogenes. They deserted Paul because they were ashamed of being associated with Paul, who was an accused criminal now. So Paul asked Timothy to reject any fear of shame and to come see him. Now, Paul knows that this is a costly request. It could put Timothy at risk. And so he reminds Timothy that Jesus' grace is a source of power, which is really important. You're going to need it because following Jesus is not easy. It requires everything that you have. Paul likens following Jesus to enrolling as a soldier who's striving to please their commanding officer. Or it's like an athlete who's training their body for a competition. Or it's like a hard-working, dedicated farmer. All three of these metaphors involve a person who's committed to something bigger than themselves and who's willing to sacrifice and endure challenges to accomplish a greater goal. And, of course, the highest example of this is Jesus himself. Because of his commitment to the Father, he suffered crucifixion by the Romans. And similarly, Paul himself is now suffering in a Roman prison. Hardship and sacrifice are inherent to the Christian life. And this is why Jesus' resurrection is the foundation of Christian hope. Or as Paul puts it in a short and very powerful poem, If we died with him, then we will live with him. If we endure, then we will reign with him. If we deny him, then he will deny us. If we are unfaithful, he will remain faithful, for he's unable to deny his own nature. God's love for our world has opened up a new hope through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so for those who will take the risk of trusting and following Jesus, God promises vindication and life. For those who reject him, God will honor that decision and do the same. But people's faithlessness will never compel God to abandon his faithfulness. And so Paul calls Timothy to faithfulness, knowing that it may come with a cost. Paul moves into the second half of the letter, calling Timothy to confront the corrupt teachers in Ephesus before he comes to Rome. Their teaching is spreading in the Ephesian church like a cancer. They've targeted and corrupted a number of influential women in the church. These are likely the wealthy women that Paul had to deal with in his first letter to Timothy. He doesn't offer much detail about the teacher's bad theology. Timothy already knows about it. But he does give us one hint. He says, they teach that the resurrection has already taken place. Now, we don't know if the teachers are following a Greek philosophical rejection of the whole idea of bodily resurrection, and they think it's only really about spiritual experience. Or it could be that they've simply distorted Paul's teaching about the resurrection life that begins now through the power of the Spirit. Either way, the problem is that they've abandoned the robust future hope of resurrection and of new creation. And they've embraced instead a private, hyper-spiritualized Christianity that is disconnected from day-to-day -day life. And so Paul calls Timothy to raise up faithful leaders who are going to teach the real good news about Jesus. They should avoid senseless arguments that result from debating the teachers. In contrast, Timothy and his leadership team are to keep the main thing the main thing. They should focus on the core storyline and message of the scriptures, which in Paul's day meant primarily the Old Testament. These scriptures, Paul says, are able to give you wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in the Messiah, Jesus. He's saying the whole point of the scriptures is to tell you a unified story that leads to Jesus and that has wisdom to offer the whole world. Then Paul talks about scripture's nature and purpose. He says, all scripture is divinely breathed, literally God-spirited. It's a reference to the Spirit's role in guiding the biblical authors so that what they wrote is what God wanted his people to hear. And God speaks to his people in the scriptures for a very practical purpose. He says they're useful for 
teaching, telling me things I didn't know before. They're useful for challenging, getting in my face about the things I say I believe but I don't actually live consistently with. They're useful for correcting me, exposing my messed up ways of thinking and behaving, and they're useful for training me in righteousness, showing me a new way to be truly human. And this is all so that God's people will be prepared for doing good. Paul closes the letter by reminding Timothy that he's probably not going to make it out of prison alive. So he asks Timothy to come as soon as possible, before winter. He doesn't want to freeze in his cell, and so he's going to need his heavy coat that he had to leave behind. And also, could Timothy please bring those personal documents that he left in Troas, likely when he got arrested. He also mentions Alexander, who's an especially dangerous man that Timothy should avoid. He's probably responsible for Paul's most recent arrest. Paul concludes by mentioning how nearly everyone's abandoned him in prison, and his only source of comfort now is the personal presence of Jesus, who stands with him and will deliver him even if he dies. And so the letter ends. The letter of 2 Timothy stands as a reminder that Paul's very influential life and mission were marked by persistent challenge and suffering and struggle. Following Jesus involves risk and sacrifice. It means inviting tension and discomfort into your life. And these things are not a sign of Jesus' absence. Rather, as Paul discovered with generations of Christians after him, that precisely in those dark and difficult moments, Jesus' love and faithfulness can become the most tangible and real. And that's what 2 Timothy, Paul's final letter, is all about. So God speaks again through his imprisoned disciple who's all alone now, near the end of his life, abandoned by his companions. How many of you have ever felt like that? A lot of times in life, just us and Jesus. And this is where the Apostle Paul pretty much feels like he is. But God speaks to him through a fellow minister of the gospel, a son. To do what? In the midst of his sorrow and his depressing circumstances, he finds him. And what does he do? He ministers to somebody else. And what does God do? He cheers him up. How many of you really realize that when you're kind of in dark, lonely times, ministering to somebody else cheers you Yeah. So Paul says, hold on to that calling of Jesus. That calling is what's going to carry you through those dark, lonely times that we all experience, do we not? Feeling alone. God also warns through this gospel of false teachers. They have abounded in every age. And they abound in our age, do they not? God reminds us His grace is enough to carry us through. His grace is sufficient for me. So God encourages because of that, endure. Tough it out. Go through until you get to the end of the race. Remember in his other writings he says, because those... If they give up before they cross the finish line, it's not going to work. We need to be faithful. God commands us, even in the midst of all these circumstances, even when we feel alone, to confront falsity that we will find around us, to confront these things. Why? Because letting a rotten apple stay in the crate will ruin a host of people, and that has eternal consequences. God reminds us that his word is God breathed. And it's powerful and useful. Why? Because it prepares us in every way. The tougher things get, the more we need to be students of God's word carry us through. God speaks to us. I will never leave you. 
I will never forsake you. Isn't that what Paul said? I appeared before Nero, and who was beside him? The Lord was by my side. Hmm. Even if everybody else abandons you, he will not. He will be faithful. Gwen, you're going to love this. One of your favorite songs. He will be faithful. He will be faithful until the end. Stand with me and sing it together.
So Lord, we acknowledge today that that is you. You are always faithful. Help us to be faithful as well to the end. Paul warned in another part of his writings that how sad it would be that we ran the race all the way right up to the finish line. And then we quit. God, help us, help us never to even contemplate such a thing. But we will faithful and be faithful just as God is all the way through until we step from this life into the next in a moment's time and see you face to face and realize that it will be worth it all. As the hymn writer says, when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we seek Christ. One glimpse of His dear face all sorrow will erase. So I gladly run the race till I see Christ. Lord, you know what we will face this week. You know everything. And we surrender our lives to you and your sovereignty today. Help us to be faithful in every way, in every thought, in every word, every deed. And we'll be sure to thank you and praise you because it's in the name of Jesus, that mighty and faithful name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in faithfulness today.